with the, what animal the kidneys came from, but that's, that's like beef too, but we didn't like that. Uh, had more cigarettes, pipe tobacco, chewing tobacco, uh, a lot more candy, a lot more cigarettes. I remember back in those days, everybody smoked. You know, said so wasn't any. I smoked pipe and uh, cigars. Uh, first sergeant and my staff was the only one who smoked cigars. Uh, and pipe, I may have been the only one who smoked pipe. So I very, very seldom ran out of pipe tobacco or cigars. Uh, it's him, stay up smoke some weird cigars. <laughs> <laughs> so, if we were in a base camp of any kind, we had cooks, uh, a lot of the food they had to prepare was dehydrated, but uh, better, it was hot, we didn't have food. Uh, I didn't borrow it from a friend of mine who had some World War II equipment but I wore our helmets, steel helmets. Uh, the straps were always burned off of them because we used the cook in. The top of them always had a dent in it because we used them as a hammer or something to drive post or peg, something like that. If like on that mountaintop I talked about in the lady. I think there were three or four of us in the foxhole. I had somebody ask me one day, what's a foxhole? You dug a hole big enough that you could be in it and not exposed. I learned from the Filipinos how to cover a foxhole with banana leaves to shingle it so it's waterproof. But we kept one steel helmet for bathroom purposes. You couldn't get out of your foxhole at night because you might get shot. So for emergency bathroom purposes, we kept a steel helmet and used the others to cook it in or bail the foxhole out with the water. Slept in the mud. Uh, one thing about the Philippines, where I was, it was not cold. I don't recall, except being in base camp, ever having a blanket. I have poncho, and I might roll up in poncho at night. Or if I'd use poncho, we'd use poncho to make a tent or something like that. Just sleep on bare ground, but you weren't cold like in Europe. They froze to death a lot of the time. So, like I say, my experiences were difficult. You could probably get somebody else out of D battery, one of the other gun crew, or maybe even somebody out of my own gun crew. There'd be 10 of us that manned the gun. You'd get a different story than what I said today. So, I have a question. Uh, did, did you have to draw straws to see whose helmet would be the emergency battery? Not that I recall. <laughs> <laughs> first come, first serve. Maybe. I don't know. Kevin just thought about that. <laughs> John, so, John, there were 10 people to each howitzer? Yeah, 8 to 10. Okay. Tell me a little bit about transporting these. I and mean, when, when you say you moved a 75 millimeter howitzer, 50 miles in in a three-day period. What's four days? Pulled it by hand. I don't think I ever that my gun crew, my gun was ever moved by a vehicle. Uh, the last the biggest stronghold of Japanese in Luzon in World War II. I wrote the name of the mountain, but we were firing across a valley that probably wasn't 300 yards away. To get up that mountain, it was too steep. They first thought that 
They would not need our artillery pieces, would need my gun crew, because it had tanks. But the tanks couldn't get up the mountain. So we had to take that gun apart, and we usually had Filipinos with us that helped move the gun, helped carry supplies, and that sort of thing. So going up that mountain, we broke that gun down into pieces, and the infantry, because we helped them, they would help us, but we had Filipino, uh, all the Filipino men you ran into were guerrillos, uh, they said. Of course, I'm sure that during the war with Japanese occupation, that those Filipinos out in the country that lived, you know, never had anything. Didn't matter to them who the conquering hero was. They did whatever they could do to keep them getting killed. Uh, there was a Filipino colonel that had been educated over in this country. Big, big man for a Filipino. We were getting ready to go out again and he was pointing to his Filipino to go with us to help take the gun, whatever. And one was squatting down on the ground. I can't do it now with a bad leg because Filipino squat. And uh, he was apparently arguing that he had just gotten back off the detail, didn't know, didn't need to go with us again. This colonel had said he was going to keep his unit together and to take over the government after the war. But this fellow was arguing with him. And that fellow general colonel pulled out 45 and shot him dead in the doornail about as far as me to Good Lord. He wanted two others to go bury him and somebody else take his place. And uh, so there wasn't, any, it wasn't any argument carrying on. Uh, back to an earlier question about rank. Uh, left that born division, brand new outfit. Uh, got out to camp and called. We had four staff sergeants. Uh, first sergeant, big tall lank fella ball. They called 12 of us in one night, and the captain said they're going to make us corporal. And I said, well, that might be a problem. And he said, why? And I said, well, we've all been in the same time, and the rest of them wonder why we're corporal. Sergeant Ball, the first sergeant, said, don't worry about it, I'll take care of that. So the next morning at formation, he had the 12 of us step forward. And he said, okay, these 12 are corporal. You'll do what they tell you to do, or if not, they'll beat your 